the studios of Wasatch Christian Church, The Message. Well, good morning, everybody, and good morning to those who are listening to us remotely off of YouTube or on the podcast. Um, thank you for being with us as we are in part two of how to be used by God this morning. So we're going to be in 2 Timothy again, chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. As we started last week, we looked back at the fact that every person has been created by God for a purpose, that everyone is useful in the kingdom of God, and everyone was created with intent and is important. But many Christians miss the full potential of their spiritual purpose because they put themselves in a place of not being fully submitted to God and completely following in God's design. Besides glorifying God, our life should be about discovering about how to be used by God to the fullest potential of everything we have, where we are and, and where God places us and who we come in contact with, and even in our individual lives of how God can use us most effectively. So last week we started off with a little kind of strange thing of comparing ourselves to either a salmon or a jellyfish. Salmon who are born in the fresh waters of the Northwest, they swim out to the ocean, they live their years there, and then at the end, for some strange reason, they swim back to their origin and they overcome every single obstacle to get there. They have a purpose, they are, have, a, have a drive, they have intent. And then there's the jellyfish that we compared some people to, that they just float through the ocean carried by the currents and the waves, no real purpose, no real intent, just floating through life from here to there. And we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20-23, which states this. As Paul is speaking to his spiritual son, Timothy, and, and uh, speaking to him about how to draw closer to God and what to do in his ministry, he states this. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of silver, of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. So last week in part one, we dove into the fact that God uses cleansed people. People that are cleansed from ungodliness, people that are cleansed from false doctrine. We learned that we must choose what type of vessel we are going to be, a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. God allows us the freedom of this moral choice to choose what type of vessel we would be. And we also learned that cleansing ourselves in godliness is our own personal responsibility. The person that is cleansed is sanctified, useful, and prepared for every good work. With this as our foundation, let's continue to pursue how we can be used by God as that's what we seek to do, isn't it? To be used by God in where we are, in what we do, with the talents and gifts and skills that God has given us, with the abilities and the places God has taken us, with the resources God has provided. It's all about glorifying God. That's the sole purpose that we were created for is to be in fellowship and glorify God. Therefore, we want to be used by God with his intention. In studying for this, I came across a statement that a Christian man once made, and I thought it was rather appropriate for this. It states this, I am here for a purpose, and that purpose is to grow into a mountain, not to shrink back to a grain of sand. Henceforth, will I apply all my efforts to become the highest mountain of all, and I will strain my potential until it cries for mercy. In essence, that could be our motto today. That we are to live for and be used by God to our fullest potential. That we would not shrink back and fall into complacency or laziness or idleness. That we would not settle for average. That we would not be like others, but that we would strive to glorify God with everything that we have, whether it be caring for a family, being a good neighbor, working hard, diligently at work, or serving in the church. Whatever it is that God has given us to do is important. And it doesn't matter whether it's washing dishes or serving in the church. It doesn't matter. It's whatever God has given us, we should strive to do that to our very best 
and purpose that God has given us. We should not settle. We should not settle for a mediocre Christian life like many do. In studying 2 Timothy, we see that Paul didn't encourage Timothy to do a couple things. Paul didn't encourage Timothy to go back to school, to get more degrees before he could do his ministry. He didn't encourage him to have a higher position. He didn't encourage him to make more money. He didn't encourage him on how to speak together, speak better and better and better. Do you know what Paul encouraged Timothy to do? As you read through 2 Timothy, Paul, the spiritual father, encouraged his son, spiritual son Timothy, the minister, to dedicate himself, to commit himself completely to God and God's will. And that's the point today. As we seek to be used by God, it should be our heart's desire to commit ourselves to the Lord. Because you see, that's an individual decision, isn't it? It's not a corporate decision. It's not a church decision. It's not a family decision. It's an individual choice, just as in salvation, that God gives us the freedom to choose to follow him or to choose to go our own way. He gives us the freedom to choose to be joyful or to choose to focus on our woes. And in this, he also gives us the freedom to choose to dedicate ourselves completely to him or to just kind of float through life like those spiritual jellyfish. So this morning our focus is choosing to dedicate ourselves to the Lord where he has us with the resources he's given us, the skills, the abilities, and the talents that we would look introspectively at those things and say, Lord, here I am. Use me. So what do plans Christians do? We looked a little bit last week at some of the things. Um, but we look at the last few verses of 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 23 this morning, and we notice the first thing in 20, verse 22, that it's a negative command that Paul gives to Timothy. It states this, Now flee from youthful lusts. Flee from youthful lusts. Now I kind of laugh at this a little bit because I'm not exactly youthful anymore, unlike Dustin. But the thing is, just because we grow older doesn't mean that those lusts, those desires, and those temptations go away, do they? In fact, sometimes they increase. Sometimes we think because we are, quote, older, we use the word more mature, that we can overcome this stuff better. But that's not always true. We always have to deal with temptation and the overcoming of that temptation, no matter what age we are. And Paul says to flee from youthful lusts, to flee. In essence, the word flee means to run away from. Those sins that we encounter when we are youthful, those desires to have things that aren't ours or that are ungodly. And Paul says to flee, to run away from those things. And again, that word flee, it's not sitting there and making time to pray about it to consider whether we should or not. It's not moseying away. To flee from something is to completely run away from it. And so as we realize that temptation is not evil in and of itself, it is an excuse to not be with God, an excuse to not do God's will. That's what temptation really is. It's just that excuse to convince ourselves that we don't have to do it God's way, that we know a better way. That temptation in itself is not the sin. The sin is when you buy into temptation. The sin is when we hang around that temptation and allow it to grow. We allow it to become common and normal, and we allow it to become part of our lives. And then we buy into it. There's an interesting illustration I came across that kind of explains to us what happens when we stay around those youthful lusts, those temptations that are there, and we don't flee from them as the Word of God says. And it's this. The way that an Eskimo kills a wolf offers us this insight of what hanging around temptation can do as it leads to sin. You see, an Eskimo kills a wolf by making the wolf be self-destructive within itself. First, what the Eskimo does is he takes his knife blade and he sharpens it. And then he takes that sharpened knife blade and he cools it down and he coats it in some animal blood and he allows it to freeze. After it freezes, 
he coats it another layer, layer of animal blood and another layer and another layer, layer until the blade itself is completely surrounded. You don't see the blade, all you have is the frozen blood around the knife. And then what the Eskimo does is he goes out, he digs a hole, and he puts that knife blade side up in the hole, pours a little water in there, and allows it to freeze, and he walks away. As the wolf comes and he smells the fresh blood upon that blade, he comes and he sees it, he finds it, and there's no one around, and the wolf begins to lick the frozen blood off of that blade. As he licks it, he begins to wipe away layer after layer after layer of the blood, and being cold, he doesn't notice that eventually what he does is the refreshing, refreshing taste of the blood that he is eating suddenly is not the blood on the blade, but it's what? It's his own blood that he is feeding himself with as he doesn't realize he is slicing his tongue with every single lick that he takes, and it's his own blood that is satisfying his hunger for food. In the morning, the Eskimo comes back and finds the wolf there, dead and frozen by the blade. You see, when we stay around sin and temptation too long, we find it as we ourselves who have been fooled in a self-destructing our own world. It's not somebody else's fault. When we hang around that temptation and we allow it to just be there and it turns into sin, it's we ourselves who have been fooled into destroying our own world, our own life, our own circumstance, just like the wolf. So, cleansed people flee from youthful lusts. They run away, they dart, they dash, they get away. But they also do something else. If we read the second part of 2 Timothy 2.22, it states this. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. So first thing is, cleanse people flee from youthful lusts. Second thing is, they pursue godliness. You see, they replace the negative with the positive. They run away from something, from one thing, and they run to something else. They run to, they pursue five things that God gives them to pursue after. Now think about the word flee and pursue. To flee is to what? Run away from something, right? As fast as you can. Don't question it. Just get away from it. Pursue on the other hand. In, on the other hand, is still that running, but it's running to something until you attain it. I think it's key, the words that Paul uses here, one is to go away as fast as you can, one is to run to something as fast as you can, to seek after it, to use all your skill, your energy, until you attain that thing that you're going after. That's what it is to pursue. You know, when I think of the... Uh, uh, PBS shows on the wildlife when you see the the lions or the leopards pursuing their meals I mean they go after with everything and that's what the pursuit is so God calls us after this cleansing of Christians to be used by God to pursue five things which is what we want to finish up with so the first thing righteousness we sing about righteousness we talk about Christians being righteous righteous but righteousness is important because righteousness is making moral and upright virtuous decisions and actions. Biblical righteousness is going beyond just being good. It's actually doing good, moral, and virtuous deeds or actions. Again, as Christians, we are doers, we are active. <clears throat> To be righteous is to live an example of Jesus himself, as righteousness is one of the key attributes of God. In fact, in Psalms 1-6, it tells us this. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Once again, contrasting those who are righteous versus those who are not righteous, which are called wicked. Righteousness is something that God calls us to pursue. He says, pursue righteousness. In fact, go after it. It's not just there. You have to go and get it. You have to go after it. You have to pursue it with energy, with effort, with intention, with purpose, with willingness to do whatever it takes 
to alleviate those excuses to be unrighteous to seek righteousness. We need to pursue righteousness until righteousness is what we are. So, righteousness is number one. Second two th or the second, third thing that Paul calls us to pursue is faith and love. Faith and love are fundamental to being a Christian. When we talk about being a biblical Christian, we look at the attributes of what a Christian is. It's faith and love. Now, in salvation, we are all given a measure of faith to have faith in God. But we need to take that faith and utilize it like a tool. A tool that's meant to be used to be functional, to be purposeful. That faith that God gives us, we need to learn how to stretch that faith in the Lord to allow Him to depend completely upon Him. And then love. That agape love. Unconditional, unwavering, un, un, or just total phenomenal love in God. So we read these two verses. One in Hebrews 6, or 11, verses 6 to 11, and in 1 John 4, 20. Hebrews 11, 6 to 7 states this. And without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's how important it is to have faith. That without faith, God tells us specifically that it's impossible to please him. Therefore, if we want to please God, what do we have to have and to utilize? Faith. We've got to have that faith in the Lord to have faith in the unseen things of heaven. Because again, the things you can see, there's somewhat control over it, right? You've heard the old saying, seeing is believing. Well, that's wrong. Unseen is believing. In fact, Jesus praises those who have never seen him and yet have faith in him and trust him. The other thing we read is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, and it states this. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, that person is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother and whom he has seen cannot love God and whom he has not seen. Again, this faith and love is something that we are called to pursue, to pursue, to go after. In other words, to enrich it, to take the faith and love that God has given us and to use it to its full potential. Faith is just believing in God in those difficult circumstances, knowing that we are not to be in control. In fact, Christians are supposed to be the most out of control people in the world, right? Because having that control is something that we can manipulate and do. But having faith in God and allowing Him to be in control Trusting the Lord that no matter what the circumstance looks like, no matter what the situation is, no matter who is for or against us, no matter whether it's a good time or a bad time, to trust in God in full confidence, with full joy, and full contentment that God is in control and going to take care of the situation. That somehow God is using this for his glory. And that we don't have to question it, or challenge it, or take control of it back. That we just trust God, that God is God, and God knows what our future is. That's much more challenging than you think it is. When uh, Christy and I and Justin were camping um, this last week, we went out to a point that we were on a dirt road, and we were driving around in our Explorer. And we came to a point where the explorer came up over this hill and went out, and you couldn't see the road. Now that's an odd feeling, right? Because you, you get up and you're looking out over the, the front of your vehicle, and all of a sudden it drops down, but you can't see the road. You don't know if it's there. Now the tracks are going back and forth. All the evidence is there that that road is perfectly fine, and people are traveling over it all the time. But when you get to that point that you're trusting in your sight, and your senses and your control, when you can't see the road anymore and the front of the vehicle starts to tip down, it's a little bit challenging. So what do you have to do at that point? You have to go back to what you know. To trust in the unseen and look at the facts around you. The 
facts for me were simple. The tracks on that road going back and forth were deeply embedded into the ground, telling me that that road had been used over and over and over. In other words, it was okay to drive over because it had been driven over dozens or hundreds of times. As the vehicle tipped and it went down, suddenly the road came back into view and all was good. But for that moment, when it's unseen, there's that question of, do you go forward? Or do you run back to what you can see and control and know? Faith that Paul encourages us to pursue is to use that faith, the unseen truth of what God promises us. To take God's promises in his word and live by them. To actually live as though God were truly God and in control. Isn't that a novel thought? And not trust our senses, but trust that God has a plan. And then love. This love is having that agape, that unconditional love for others, that we see the fullest potential in them in spite of what is in front of our face, that we don't see the person there that we like or don't like or agree with or don't agree with, but rather we see what God can do in them and what God is developing in them and creating in them over time. That they, like us, are a work in progress. And they're not finished yet. That we don't see just what we see visibly. In essence, we do as, as God does and sees into the future to what they can be and will be and could be in God's plan. Now, one thing with this love, again, it's not the love that we hear in the world about, oh, you have to be tolerant of everybody and accept them for who they are. In this agape love that God calls us to pursue, to grow into, it's a love that does not waver from the doctrines of the Bible, the basics of Christianity. But it is learning to appreciate the differences of people that are different than us or have a different view upon the world. One thing I came across with this was a story of Mike Favaris that he shared how he had to be challenged in his love for another culture because he went down to Africa and he was having an opportunity to be part of a church service in this tribe in Africa. Um, couldn't understand it. They were an African and doing all and, and the, that spoken language. But he said, here's the thing that challenged him in love as he went down with these fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in Africa. The men in this tribe, when they went to the church service, were bare-chested. You see, it was considered rude to cover yourself up with a church, with a shirt, or with some kind of covering during a church service. He said, being an American, a little overweight, white American, to go down to that tribe and to take his shirt off and be content with that in the church service was a challenge. But he had to learn to do that because in that culture, that's what was reverent. Now, coming back to the United States, that's just the opposite. If I came up and preached to you without my shirt on, you'd probably run me out pretty quick or you'd be scared to death, right? But that love is learning to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ to accept the different cultures, the different mindsets, the different skills and abilities that God has blessed them with. And not only accept them, but to appreciate them. To learn to understand how God is using those individuals to advance his kingdom with the gifts, skills, abilities, and culture that God has given them just in the same way that he's given us. Pursue love. The love that Jesus had. When we look at Jesus, Jesus went to the unlovely, the unaccepted, the outcast, the sick, the politically corrupt. Jesus went to those who were not necessarily socially acceptable, but he went to them. And he loved them, and he shared the gospel with them. And even though some of them were struggling in sin or struggling with other things, he still went to them in that agape love. So as we pursue love, we learn to love those who are unlovely, who are socially unacceptable, who are struggling, who are down and out, who live in a world of deception and deceit, we learn to love them and to go, 
to the mountain. That's Jesus did. Next thing is peace. We are called to pursue peace. Here's the crazy thing about peace, or we could call it unity. Peace doesn't just happen. You have to create peace, right? Because usually what happens is mass chaos. If you come in a room and just let people mingle around and do whatever they want, it's usually loud and noisy and there's multiple discussions. To have peace, to have unity, we have to strive to work to create that. We have to put out effort. We have to draw others together and have a plan and a purpose and say, let's gather in this way. Let's do this. Let's come together and be of one mind, of one spirit, of one God. We have to make effort to be at peace. And what that means in that peace is that if we come together, even as a church, that we have to be reverent and respectful of one another. And sometimes we have to be more silent than we are vocal. We have to go along with the plan instead of do our own thing. We have to, in essence, sometimes conform to others' opinions and others' decisions instead of always have things our way. Peace has to be created. And God calls us to pursue peace. One of the great stories of an individual who pursued peace and unity and the sharing of the gospel was a, uh, a young preacher named James Hudson Taylor who lived in the 1800s. He was literally the first individual that truly brought Christianity to China. Now, Mr. Taylor had to do several things. First, he was British. The British churches looked upon the Chinese as degrading, as less than, in stature, their own British nature, because the British were upper class. They had etiquette. They had money. They had a very clean, well-to-do life. And they looked at the Chinese as being, in essence, foul, dirty, unetiquette, uncultured and kind of low life. The British looked at the Chinese as kind of being the hillbillies of the world of the time. So what James Hudson Taylor did was he left the pomp and the, the upper class of his British society. He left the high class of the British churches and he went to China. And when he went to China, he didn't just go to China. He went to China, he got rid of his British clothes, he put on the clothing of the Chinese people. He cut his hair in the style of the Chinese people. He ate the food of the Chinese people and gave up his good British kippered snacks. He took on the culture of the Chinese people, all while doing this, but not giving up his Christian biblical doctrine. And he shared the gospel. In this pursuit of peace to bring peace, the peace of God, to the people of China, James Hudson Taylor took on the entire culture of the Chinese people, but kept his Christian doctrine. He did that for over two decades. The result of his life work in bringing peace to that culture and leaving who he was to become who God would have him to be resulted in this. He was responsible over the decades for bringing over 800 additional missionaries to China. He was responsible for establishing over 125 schools in China to educate people. And he was personally responsible for converting over 18,000 individuals to Christianity and leading them to Jesus as Savior. James Hudson Taylor in his seeking to leave who he was to become who God would have him to be, changed the world to China and expanded the gates of heaven. Mr. Taylor, when he had these 800 missionaries come over, had but two expectations and one ask of them, which I think was very interesting. The first ask of these 800 missionaries that would come to China and minister with them was that they both had to do, they had to do both work and ministry while they were there. Because James Hudson Taylor did not want the Chinese people to see these new missionaries as lazy and depending on others to provide for them, that they had to work and minister at the same time. The second thing 
that he called them to do was what we looked at earlier and have faith. They had to trust God to provide all their supplies. In fact, it's written that he asked a lot of them not to have missionary support in the early years from Britain or other people. But he asked the missionaries to come over in complete trust, take on the culture that was there, and trust God for everything. That's that thing called faith that we looked at beforehand. In the pursuit of peace to bring the gospel to the Chinese culture, he sought it with everything he had. Put yourself in that position. Going to another country, getting rid of every American thing you have, walking away from all your possessions, walking away from all your family, walking away from your Americanized church. You're taking on a whole new culture, a whole new food, a whole new style of dress, a whole new style of hygiene, a whole new language, holding to your biblical doctrines to bring the gospel to others. The question is, how far are you and I willing to go to serve God? To pursue peace, how much are we willing to leave who we are to become who God would have us to be? That's the question. You see, when it comes to dealing with peace and bringing peace, in other words, creating peace purposely, he relays this. There are those who are to be used by God to pursue, to seek after, and strike peace, even though it means changing themselves. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges we have as American Christians, is not having it, as McDonald says, what? Our way. Burger King. Oh, Burger King, thank you. Blasphemy in German. <laughs> having it, not having it our way, but having it God's way or Yahweh. The last thing that Paul speaks to Timothy to pursue is fellowship. As he tells Timothy and those in that church in Ephesus to be with those who, quote, call upon the Lord from a pure heart. That's fellowship. That's banding together to be together, to surround yourself with those Christians who are sold out to God whether they're different than you or not. Fellowship is kind of in the image of a campfire, which this last week I'm real familiar with. You see one hot ember in the fire, being next to more hot embers keeps each other hot and, and pure in that fire, don't they? But you take that ember out and you place it solo, alone. What happens to that ember? It begins to grow dark, and cold. And the only way to relight that ember is what? Put it back in the fellowship. And when you have all those embers in that campfire and they're gathering together and you're getting more and more embers, that fire grows brighter and hotter and purer. And it burns away all the chaff, all the negativeness, and it burns brightly. We are to surround ourselves with those who walk the walk and talk the talk and to put ourselves away from those who squawk the talk for their own purposes. That we're to gather together intentionally and purposely with those who are sold out for God. To share that, in essence, that spiritual fire with one another to keep each other invigorated. It's why we gather at least once a week for church. Because we've gone through the world throughout the week, and we need to encourage one another, to sharpen one another, to be with one another, to relight and kindle that fire. That as we go out and do our ministry, we come back together in fellowship, and we relight and ignite that warm fire again. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 states this. Isaiah writes, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, I, here am I, send me. D.L. Moody, a famous preacher that you may have heard about, read that section of scripture. He wrote these, these words in his personal Bible right next to the margin of that scripture. He writes this, I am only one. But I am 
one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. As we come together in fellowship, we realize this. Every church is filled with willing people. Some willing to work, and others willing to let them work, right? We need to be those, as Nehemiah states, who have a mind, a desire to work for God, to pursue fellowship and to build that fellowship up as we surround ourselves with other believers who are radically sold out for God and doing God's will. And that doesn't mean to be in a mega church or a small church. That means to find individuals who love the Lord with all their heart, their might, their strength, and to go to where they are, to be with them, not to wait for them to come to us or invite us to be with them, but to go where they are and to begin serving God with them and make that fire contagious. We close up this morning the fact that once again, we remember that God has created us intentionally and for a purpose and for a ministry. We realize that there are many mediocre Christians in the world who miss being used by God, and then according to the section of Scripture in 2 Timothy, are vessels of dishonor. They're still used by God, but they're not used in what I would call magnificent ways. And what Paul writes to Timothy, we take to heart today to make the decision to cleanse ourselves from unrighteousness, to flee youthful lust, to pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and fellowship, to pursue it, to go after it. Like those salmon that we talked about next week, to let no obstacle keep us from our goal. To let no excuse keep us from doing God's will. We come together this morning and we make the decision to say, God, here I am. Use me. As in the words of D.L. Moody once again, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do, and what I ought to do by the grace of God, I will do. This morning, I invite you and encourage you to choose to be a vessel of honor, to be used by God pursue that which God calls us to pursue, to flee from that which God calls us to flee, and to always see the best in all things, to be content in what God provides us, whether it's ministry or resources, and to use those to the very maximum of their potential. May God be with you as you seek him this week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the message that you speak through Paul to Timothy and to the church in Ephesus. That Lord, that little church in Ephesus had a lot of challenges and a lot of struggles and a lot of issues. But you spoke your word in that church and you used individuals who are willing to leave who they were to become who you would have them to be, to change that church, to pursue that peace, to grow that faith and love, to seek righteousness be in fellowship, to run from sin. Lord, we pray this morning. I pray for each individual here and those who are listening that we would take up the decision to cleanse ourselves for you, to choose to be vessels of honor. In essence, in our example, to choose to be salmon Christians for you. Let nothing keep us from our goal, to overcome all things the do it determination and joy we pray that in all this that we would be useful in your hands willing to be used how you would use us to go where you would have us to go to serve how you would have us to serve to love how you would have us to love unconditionally and lord we pray in all this that you would be honored and we say this in jesus name.